emergency preparedness of the District of Columbia. The House Government Reform Subcommittee on the District of Columbia heard from security and government officials here, Maryland and Virginia. The hearing, which runs about two and a half hours, was chaired by Representative Connie Morella of Maryland. the subcommittee of the District of Columbia or the Government Reform Committee for our hearing on uh, emergency preparedness in the nation's capital. A few weeks ago, or a few weeks after the terrorist attacks of last September 11th, this subcommittee uh, held its first hearing on emergency preparedness in the nation's capital. The news then was not good. Although our first responders, the firefighters, police, and emergency medical technicians did wonderful work, there was widespread acknowledgement that the regional response in terms of coordinating the evacuation of employees and communicating with the general public was sorely lacking. To review, the emergency broadcasting system, which is designed for this type of emergency, was not put to use. People believe the metro system was shut down when, when, in fact, it was operational. Federal and local government employees and many private sector workers were let out of their jobs starting at around 10 a.m., about the same time that at least one of the major Potomac River crossings was shut down, creating even more traffic chaos. At the time of last year's hearing, I said, Washington must be the most prepared city and region in the event of a terrorist attack or other emergency. So one of our hopes today is to determine how far we have progressed toward that goal. Is the nation's capital now the best prepared city? And is the national capital region the best prepared region? In the event of another catastrophic emergency, would the federal government and local governments communicate well with each other? Would our residents, businesses, and tourists receive quick notification of what to do and what not to do? As you all know, we now have a nationwide color-coded terror alert warning system, and we're currently in code orange. And we have been for a week and a half. I know there's concern among the general public over what these color warnings translate to. Does orange mean that you should work from home on that day? Does red mean we should pull the kids out of school? We don't have the answers. We do have a large and noteworthy panel of local, state, regional, federal, and private sector leaders here today, and I appreciate your all coming. Um, and and uh, we hope that you will be able to help us answer these questions. It's unusual, to say the least, for us to have 10 witnesses in one large panel. But this was done for a reason. One of the lessons that we learned on September 11 is the difficulty of communicating among different levels of government, between government and the private sector, between law enforcement and transportation. So now we have all of the elements at the same table, or at least at the same tables, but we've done it with one table. And I think that that will help us to knock down some of those communication barriers. I'm asking the panel to indulge the subcommittee and to keep our opening statements to about three, three minutes so that we can have an opportunity to ask questions. Please know that your total testimony verbatim will be included uh, in the record. And we'll get things moving a little bit quicker. A great deal of our discussion today will center on the various plans that have been developed in the wake of the September 11th attacks. The Council of Governments has a regional emergency coordination plan for the region. And I will note that in addition to the testimony of Tacoma Park Councilman Bruce Williams, I'm going to enter into the record testimony from D.C. Councilwoman Carol Schwartz, who heads COG's Emergency Preparedness Task Force, but could not be with us today. The governors of Maryland and Virginia and the mayor of the District of Columbia held a summit and signed a joint statement pledging cooperation on many emergency preparedness and security issues. 
The Federal Emergency Management Agency has told us that it is working on a regional response plan, and the Office of Personnel Management has developed a framework for notifying federal employees about emergency situations. So we have no shortage of plans. The mere existence, however, of these plans, which represent real progress, much thought and hard work has gone into their creation, but we have to make sure that these plans are coordinated as much as possible. And we have to make sure that these plans are tested so that we're confident that they will work in an emergency. One reason for the effectiveness of our first responders on September 11th is that they routinely participate in mutual aid drills where they learn to work together and put into practice the plans that exist on paper. There must be similar efforts in terms of our emergency readiness proposals. And in looking at these plans, I also want to get feedback from the uh, panel on legislation that was introduced by Senator Sarbanes to amend the proposed Homeland Security Act. His bill would create an office within the new Homeland Security Agency to oversee and coordinate the various federal counterterrorism and preparedness programs in the national capital region. I endorse the concept of this legislation. I, I think we've come to the point where we need someone high in the federal government who is solely responsible for coordination of federal responses within the national capital region. And I'm very interested to hear our witnesses' thoughts on, on that proposal. Another important factor that we must not forget is the role of the private sector. There are about 350,000 federal workers in the national capital region, but there are another 2.4 million private sector employees. About 80% of the region's critical infrastructure, power plants, water distribution, communications providers, lies in the hands of businesses, not the government. Our government, federal, state, local, regional, must have a way to effectively communicate with our businesses and their workers in times of emergency, as well as to involve them in the decision-making progress and process. And true emergency preparedness demands that everyone, business, government, the general public, is, uh, is in the loop. And so I now, after that opening statement, will yield to my ranking member, the distinguished Congresswoman uh, Norton. Thank you very, very much, Madam Chair. And thank you for uh, calling this hearing uh, in a timely fashion one year after uh, the first attack. Uh, two, year, uh, two weeks ago, uh, I traveled to New York to the site of the first Congress in the nation's first capital for a commemorative joint meeting of Congress. Members of the House and the Senate visited Ground Zero and participated in a unique and moving ceremony. At the same time, I was struck by how contained the area of the Twin Towers devastation appeared and how normal the rest of New York was. In contrast, the District of Columbia was not directly hit, but there are telltale footprints of 9-11 throughout downtown Washington. Today we want to learn just what we have learned and what lies beneath the outward and visible signs of September the 11th and the anthrax tragedy that took the lives of two dedicated postal workers on October 21st and 22nd. It would be difficult to overestimate the complexity of the district's post 9-11 challenge and similar challenges faced by the region. The city must meet its primary obligation to protect almost 600,000 local residents. The city must secure the seat of government and the entire federal presence. The city must collaborate with a large number of federal, county, and state authorities and police agencies to whom the district is now tied and must link itself in entirely new ways. As the Joint House and Senate Intelligence Committee hearings that began this week are demonstrating, Neither the federal government nor any part of our federal system of governance was prepared in any way 
for either 9-11 or the anthrax attack. The shocking irrationality and brutality of the unprecedented attacks left governments scrambling to afford greater security. The district was still recovering from the most serious financial crisis in a century and had just begun to rebuild protective and emergency services sufficient to protect its own residents, not to mention the federal complex and the 370,000 federal employees who work here and in the region. After some prodding, the Appropriations Committee realized that the ball was in its court and that the district is the only first responder of any significant size here because it is the only big city in the region. Congress appropriated $156 million for the district and $39 million for Metro in the D.C. appropriation. The total for the region as a whole appropriated by the Congress has been $432 million. It was clear that the September 11th attack on a civilian population necessitated immediate action without a period of careful planning. The new money was necessary just to supply the basics, particularly gear and basic equipment for frontline workers in case of another attack. Uh, the past year, therefore, is perhaps best understood as an emergency response year where the least difficult, most obvious, and most pressing needs were tackled. No one pretends that there has been time to move from the raw basics to where we must go, to a seamless prevention and response capability, first in the city and then in the region, covering 17 different jurisdictions. Until now, the region has depended almost entirely on the Council of Governments, or COG, for regional coordination. COG received $5 million in, FY 2000, in the FY 2002 Defense Supplemental Appropriation, and under the able leadership of Executive Director Michael Rogers, has, has facilitated communication and coordination, even though COG has no enforcement authority. COG will continue to play an indispensable role. However, I have been working in the Congress to afford even greater capability for the region, and each jurisdiction in the region must do the same within its own jurisdiction and jointly. On Wednesday, for example, the Senate passed an amendment to the pending Homeland Security Act that includes and extends a provision I added in the House requiring the Homeland Secretary to work directly with the mayor of the District of Columbia on security matters. The Senate provision adds the governors of Maryland and Virginia and establishes an office and a director uh, for the national capital region. That office will coordinate, plan, and execute activities to enhance emergency preparedness. This new capability, tied directly to the Homeland Secretary, appropriately recognizes that this city and region contain virtually our entire government, including the White House, the Congress, the Supreme Court, and 370,000 federal employees and that special focused attention is required if we are serious about the unique demands for security in the national capital region. This provision is an example of the new multi-jurisdictional coherence that should be the lodestar as we strive to create mechanisms equal to the threats we, we face, even with all that must be done. What has been done persuades me that the District of Columbia is the most secure city in the world today. Nevertheless, the emergency preparedness actions of the federal government often have been clumsy, ineffective, excessive, and insensitive. Our residents do not walk the city in fear. What they do fear is that in great haste and with little experience, authorities will be too quick to close down the city and too slow to assure that the district remains the world's symbol of an open society. Today, I will be listening to hear whether we are learning to meet the two great challenges of security and openness at the same time. 
without sacrificing one for the other and without stealing the gloss from our shining city on the hill. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Congresswoman Norton. I'm now very pleased to uh, recognize uh, a colleague from Virginia, Tom Davis, who is my predecessor as chair of this committee. Mr. Davis. Yeah, thank you, uh, Madam Chairman, and I want to thank you for organizing today's follow-up hearing on the progress of emergency preparedness in the District of Columbia. I want to note we have George Forsman from Commonwealth of Virginia here, and uh, with him is our former Lieutenant Governor and uh, now a member of our governor's cabinet as we uh, work uh, when it comes to, for homeland security and state security work in a bipartisan fashion in Virginia, uh, John Hager. And it's good to see you here as well. Over the past year, a national capital region and jurisdictions around the country have been working to bolster their emergency response plans. In the midst of crisis, the district must be prepared to handle concerns common to other major metropolitan areas. This includes ensuring the health and safety of residents, employees, and visitors, implementing a coordinated emergency management plan, conducting quick and safe evacuations, and coordinating with local jurisdictions. However, Washington's crisis response capability is often complicated by the needs of the federal government. Because of the district's unique status as the nation's capital, a multitude of local, state, and federal governments and agencies must coordinate their efforts to effectively respond to emergencies. For example, federal agencies have the authority to close streets, which may impact evacuation procedures. Local officials have to scramble to reallocate personnel and other resources in order to successfully accommodate federal agencies while safely evacuating citizens. I understand that coordinating state, local, and federal governments in a host of public health and law enforcement organizations is a mammoth task. However, I do have some concerns that I hope witnesses can address. The, Washington, uh, the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments developed a regional emergency coordination plan to facilitate communication and coordination among the local jurisdictions. The plan released last week contains many solid recommendations and clearly represents many hours of diligent work. But questions remain. As the Northern Virginia Transportation Alliance noted on Wednesday in testimony before the National Capital Region Transportation Planning Board, it said, in focusing almost exclusively on chains of command, procedures, playbooks, and technology, COG's plan is devoid of substantial recommendations regarding the fundamental issue of lack of system capacity and reliability." Unquote. The question for today's panel is, why is there not yet a list of key infrastructure improvements necessary to respond to future disasters? Since this plan has not yet been incorporated into an emergency response plan, are COG members considering alternate procedures? Additionally, it's my understanding that the current Federal Emergency Decision and Notification Protocol, which outlines the procedures for closing federal agency, does not integrate the Homeland Security Advisory System into its process. I'm concerned that this could lead to inconsistencies in the closure of federal agencies and could jeopardize the welfare of the federal employees. The Senate has approved amendments to its version of the Homeland Security Department legislation that would create an Office for National Capital Region Coordination, in essence creating a federal Homeland Security Director for the D.C. region. I understand the rationale for this move. Just as private sector companies with technology to aid in homeland defense have had difficulty determining where to turn for an audience and for answers in the federal government, so too are regional governments, organizations and transit operators grappling with a wide array of different players with different levels of authority. I'm certain, too, that COG, WMATA, and others are eager to find a direct route to work within the administration on the annual budget process. I'm eager to hear about the pros and cons of this approach, including panelists' thoughts on whether the Senate language simply adds another layer of bureaucracy that will slow down rather than streamline regional preparedness efforts. Madam Chairman, last month's security summit organized by the Office of Homeland Security brought together state, federal agencies, and the private sector. Virginia, Maryland, and the district agreed to use the Emergency Management Assistance Compact to share personnel resources in emergencies and to work toward a variety of security objectives. I commend the participants for their effort. I'm confident that local jurisdictions and governments can work together to create an emergency preparedness plan that corrects the present deficiencies and is flexible enough to respond to a wide array of crises. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Davis. And now, uh, in, in conjunction with the policy of this subcommittee and the full committee, I will ask uh, those uh, who are testifying if you would stand and raise your right hand so I can swear you in. Do you swear that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. The um, report will designate affirmative response by all. Um, and as I start, 
Our first uh, testifier will be Terrence Gaynor, the Chief of Police, United uh, States Capitol Police. And I know that, Chief Gaynor, I know that you're going to be leaving after you present your testimony so that you can um, participate in the 11 o'clock graduation ceremony. Right, of 44 police officers yes, at the Dirksen building. Great, so I, I will start off with you, Mr. Gaynor, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chairwoman and members of the committee. I am pleased to appear before you today to discuss the emergency preparedness in our nation's capital and appreciate the help that Congress has given my agency to better prepare itself. I think I'm in somewhat a unique position because just three months ago, I was the Executive Assistant Chief of the Metropolitan Police Department and sat on the opposite side of the table during many of the discussions that were going on between the city and the Capitol Complex area. But we all know that no single event in the history of Washington tested the area's emergency preparedness and interagency cooperation more than the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001. Likewise, the October 15th anthrax attack once again necessitated public safety and public health agencies to formulate a plan to address the myriad of issues posed by that act of terrorism. Each agency has emergency response plans which will guide their individual operations. However, it is clear that no single agency in the Washington metropolitan area has the personnel and resources to unilaterally handle a terrorist or a critical incident. I am pleased the Metropolitan Washington Council of Government took a leadership role and developed a task force on homeland security and emergency preparedness for the national capital region in order to help coordinate and optimize resources in the event of a critical incident. As a result of their work, the U.S. Capitol Police and other public and private sector stakeholders will partner in the Regional Emergency Coordination Plan and the Regional Incident Communication and Coordination System. We have also learned that the actions taken by one agency to meet their public safety responsibilities may adversely affect the operations of another agency. A clear example is the issue of street closures. There are sometimes are legitimate needs to close streets or restrict traffic within the Capitol complex during emergency situations or due, due to security concerns. However, we understand that such actions place a burden on the Metropolitan Police Department and other city agencies, as well as the citizens, especially when Constitution and Independence Avenues are affected. That is why we closely coordinate with the city and other agencies when we must close our streets or alter traffic flow within the Capitol complex. And I can say I think the last thing that Mayor Williams said to me as I left that city agency, and the first thing that the Congresswoman Norton said to me as I approached this new job was don't dare close those streets without strong communication between the city and the Capitol Complex community. In fact, in response to that, the U.S. Capitol Police, the Metropolitan Police, and the District Department of Transportation have recently formed two groups which will coordinate, coordinate security projects or programs that may impact the city's ability to manage vehicular traffic. An executive leadership steering committee consisting of Mr. Dan Tangerlini, director of the District Department of Transportation, Chief Charles Ramsey of the Metropolitan Police Department, and myself will meet periodically to address new and current issues. The second group is the Traffic Flow Committee composed of senior representatives of those three agencies. These two groups will ensure that there is a close coordination between our agencies and to resolve any issues raised by security projects or programs prior to their implementation. The United States Capitol Police has also taken specific actions to increase our response and mitigation capabilities, such as purchasing new emergency equipment and specialized vehicles, increasing the number of sworn personnel, which will grow by 44 in just 45 minutes, implementing a comprehensive training program, and developing a chemical biological strike team that uh, will be rivaled by none in the United States. We also participate in regional multi-agency emergency re response training exercises, one of which was held by Mr. Laporte just last week, which are very critical to our joint preparedness. I believe it is no longer a question of if another terrorist attack will occur. Regretfully, it is now a question of when, where, and in what form. We must learn the difficult lessons from prior incidents and pledge to increase our vigilance and preparedness. In order to be successful in our efforts, the leaders of all public safety agencies in the national capital area must support and adhere to three guiding principles. 
cooperation, coordination, and communication. Cooperation among all public safety and public service agencies across all federal, state, and local boundaries with regard to consequent management and resource sharing. Coordination of emergency response plans and emergency response actions and communications of incident information, planned actions, and requests for assistance all are keys to effective preparedness and response. A major goal of the United States Capitol Police is to carefully balance our security requir requirements with reasonable access to this area while maintaining the historic vista of this Capitol ca campus. The United States Capitol Police has made significant strides since last year's heartless attacks, and we are now better prepared for such, any such future incidents. We will continue to work closely with Congress, the Council of Governments, our public safety partners, private stakeholders, to improve the security, the safety, and preparedness of our nation's capital. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chief Gaynor. I'm going to allow, I know you've got to leave, but I'm going to allow Ms. Norton to ask you uh, one question. Then any other questions, we will submit to you in writing for your response. Thank you very much for accommodating that graduation of ours. I, I, I appreciate the, the Chairman's indulgence. Uh, I, I, I want to uh, uh, thank uh, you, uh, Chief Gaynor, for the improved communication in advance of changes in our streets. Um, for example, when these new barriers were put up, uh, uh, or the barriers that are now in the ground and can go up on Constitution and Independence, apparently key people in the District of Columbia did know. I must tell you, I didn't know. And the press came, went crazy, uh, because they didn't know. And therefore, I'd like to make a suggestion. In addition, the community also did know. And so all kinds of calls came in, are they trying to keep us from getting out of town in case something happens? The lesson to be learned from that is it's not enough to tell the administrator or somebody in, in DMV or whoever it is. Uh, when particularly given the nature of this city and the people who live here, when they see things happening and don't know about it and the press hasn't been informed, the, the press assumes the worst because they want a story. So I'm going to ask you, in advance of any changes of that kind, not only to notify the District of Columbia, but to notify this committee, yes, the chairman and me. I'm going to ask you also uh, if you would simply go before the press yourselves and explain to the press and thereby inform the public what is happening so that we don't get conspiracy theories and we don't get people's backs up. Already we see improved communication with the district government. Now the public believes it has a right to know. I'm asking you if you would get back to me on uh, uh, precisely how the extended jurisdiction, my bill from 1993, is being carried out now. And finally, let me ask you a question about the IMF. Uh, I'm very pleased with how you are working with the District of Columbia. Your men are going to be on the front line. Uh, you have been working hand in glove with the D district police. Uh, when I called Mr. Livingood, our sergeant at arms, about perhaps sending a dear colleague to in inform staff uh, and members that they might want to take public transportation, I found out that he was way ahead of me. Uh, I do want to ask you this. We have noted, the chief has called me, concerning uh, what appears to be an attempt to up the ante, choke point. We, these people are going to try to close down the district. They have always, of course, fomented all kinds of trouble around the place. But they are now talking about closing down chuck, uh, choke points, such as the circles around the city, such as the highways where you get in and out of the uh, city. Uh, they're talking about smashing uh, the windows of downtown office buildings, even of places like McDonald's. I have every confident in you, confidence in you and in our own DC police to be where you need to be in order to take care of these things. But I have to ask you, particularly given uh, the desire of some of these people uh, to keep people from moving in and out of the city, whether or not, given the emergency procedures that we have adopted after 9-11, whether it, this complicates dealing with demonstrations, peaceful or not, that come into the city, and how, how you find it different, if you find it different at all, to deal with such demonstrations in the face of the need to keep the city open, whether for ambulances, which was always the case, but now even for emergency uh, preparedness. Yes, thank you. 
with the events that will transpire a week from start a week from today, in conjunction with the threat level that the metropolitan area is at, there are additional risk. Uh, we are uncertain, although we have no specific information, whether terrorists could use this type of uh, disruption, these mostly peaceful protests along with the hooligans, to their advantage. And to extent the protest organizers are indicating they're going to shut down the city, particularly on Friday, I think it is a particularly dangerous uh, situation that we could find ourselves. However, that having been said, Chief Ramsey and the Metropolitan Police Department, in conjunction with uh, not only the surrounding law enforcement agencies, but agencies as far away uh, as Macon, Georgia, or Chicago, in addition to Maryland, Pennsylvania, and Virginia, are sending su uh, sufficient forces that we think that will be well positioned uh, to try to uh, mitigate any of the disruption, but it does make it tougher. And I think that the Chief's uh, and Deputy Mayor Kellum's suggestion that we use public transportation and minimize car use, listen to the police and uh, press reports about where and what could happen will be essential to making this uh, soon uh, easier. We've also sat down with the United States Attorney and Maine Justice to talk about whether these type of activities are so uh, deleterious to the security efforts that we ought to take very proactive actions, uh, whether there's uh, um, uh, violations of law that, that are, are so potentially egregious that they outweigh the, the First Amendment rights of someone to come in and speak what they want and shut down our intersection. So we're trying to balance those two things. Thank you, Chief. I just want to say I'm pleased that after some discussions with the White House, we were able to get money yes. uh, to pay the police who are coming from other jurisdictions. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Norton, and thank you, uh, Chief Gaynor. Uh, we look forward to working with you and watching what happens next week, too. Thank you very much for Thank you for your face. leadership, ma'am. Thank you. I'd like to recognize the fact that we've been joined by uh, a very important member of the committee, Ms. Watson from California. I don't know whether you have an opening statement or want us to just proceed with our testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Watson. Uh, so I'm now pleased to uh, call on Peter Laporte, Director of the District of Columbia Emergency Management Agency. Thank you for being with us, Mr. Laporte. Good morning, uh, Chairperson Morella and members of the committee. Um, I'm going to synchronize my uh, comments here and synopsize them. We appreciate um, it. Right after September 11th, Mayor Williams convened a domestic preparedness task force. It's evolved into a preparedness council focusing on rewriting our district response plan. We rewrote our, the, the response plan based on the emergency support function model of the federal government. Having the two plans being able to be synchronized in the same language and vocabulary have served us well, and those particular plans match up exactly with Maryland, Virginia in the same language. Beyond just redoing our district response plan, we've made it a, a real effort to be part of uh, to getting the word out to the community. Uh, in doing so, we've rewritten again our family preparedness guide. Our preparedness guide is uh, found in seven different languages as well as Braille. Recently, it's been um, redone again to show the event routes of the city, those specific routes that are being coordinated with Maryland, Virginia, to expedite the commute of people getting out of town. Um, we've reached out over a million copies of this have been made around the country to other states, other jurisdictions. Additionally, we've focused a great deal on training. The district has invited members of other jurisdictions into our training, both Arlington, Montgomery, PG, Alexandria. The training includes personal preparedness, the response plan, incident command, coop planning, as well as many others. In addition to the 1,500 district, district and regional personnel that have been trained in a various emergency preparedness response classes, the district is reaching out to the community and business and schools. Over 120 businesses have been trained. 11 of the 14 colleges that make up the consortium of colleges and universities in the area have gone through a great deal of training. Approximately 300 public school officials, over 300 community leaders have participated in emergency preparedness training. In the month of September alone, over 75 courses have been offered to support the district's training programs. The history of collaboration and training has been, uh, has been in evidence uh, well, much earlier than this. In March of uh, 2002, the district participated with the Army Corps of Engineers in a senior, senior leadership uh, uh, exercise. In March 29th of uh, May 29th of this year, we held a biological tabletop where over 300 participants from FEMA and CDC and a number of agencies. And as Chief Gaynor was, has said, 
Uh, just last week on the 13th, we had over 200 people participate in a chemical exercise scenario, along with the Council of Governments, along with our federal partners. Again, we've also held, held the summit on the 5th of, of August, where Maryland, Virginia, and the District with Homeland Security agreed, agreed to eight action items, and those action items committing to information sharing and protective actions and, and moving forward on the EMAC and training, and focusing on community education as one of the key components of that. With this collaboration between the partners, we've really made some great strides in this area. But the goal is to be the most prepared jurisdiction in the country. And we've come, we're coming a lot closer to getting there. Through the RICS program that uh, the Council of Governments representative will speak to, through the Washington Area Warning System where we can touch 67 different agencies throughout the region with a push of one button, our preparedness and coordination has, has gotten a lot better. But we have to strive to get even better, the private sector, nonprofits, business, industry. It's got to be a comprehensive, collaborative approach, including all our jurisdictions, local, state, federal, horizontal, and vertical. The coordination and challenges we face day in, day out are very real. It's been a great, great deal of work that, that's gone, gone on over the last year in this region. We've come a long way, but we still have a long way to go. We look forward to the support of this committee as we've seen it in the past. It's been just starward. And we uh, look forward to working with you and with our partners here at the table. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Laporte. This is a, a very uh, engaging book, looks pretty clear. Um, I'd now like to recognize Donald Kelson, who is the acting director of the Maryland Emergency Management Agency. You demonstrate this truly as regional. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Madam Chair and uh, other members. The uh, state of Maryland has been actively involved in uh, increasing preparedness, not only within the state, but with a priority for the national capital region. Uh, as examples, in the planning arena, we've been key players, uh, active in bioterrorism, uh, task force planning, completed state planning for handling the national pharmaceutical stockpile. We'll actually be exercising elements of that plan uh, in Montgomery County on the 25th of this month. Uh, as Peter mentioned, uh, our state emergency operations and tourism annex mirror the structure of the federal response plan and the other regional partners, which is uh, a key indication of how they'll work together. Uh, additionally, we've been a key partner in transportation planning uh, and coordinating routes, signal timing, and communications. We've been actively involved, not only as the state, but our jurisdictions uh, in the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments Task Force and uh, the regional coordination plan. Uh, we'll also be one of the hubs for the regional incident communications and coordination systems. We've also been uh, actively involved with uh, the Potomac Conference, Greater Washington Board of Trade, uh, which is key because the private sector uh, is key, as the chair pointed out, not only from an employee standpoint, but much of the infrastructure uh, that we need to think of when we look at the larger region uh, comes from the private sector, so that relationship is key. Uh, Peter covered the, uh, the aspects of the summit. One of the things that I think is important as we move forward from that summit is the active federal participation uh, by various federal agencies in those commitments to action. In the training arena, we continue to collaborate among the, uh, the jurisdictions, D.C., Virginia, and Maryland, on training and on exercising, focusing not only on first responder training, but as was pointed out, some senior official training uh, and also medical health and even public works people that need some training because they may come in contact with some of the incidents. Uh, we participated with the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments on their familiarization workshop, which was an effort to educate federal and other regional partners on how we operate so we can understand and operate better together. Uh, in the realm of exercises, we've had a, a history of working together uh, again, it was alluded to the exercise uh, last Friday in that uh, cooperative effort and also looking forward to uh, full field exercise involving uh, the district elements within the federal government from the district, Virginia and Maryland. I guess the, the, the final aspect that I'd really like to emphasize is, aside from the plans themselves, I guess Washington and, uh, said it best, the plan really is nothing. It's planning that's important, and the planning is going on. The relationships that are established, and almost everybody here at the panel knows each other very well and speak almost on a weekly basis. We know each other better. We'll be able to coordinate things because the plan 
will not always go according to uh, how it was laid out. You'll need to adapt, and we'll be able to do that because we're working together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kelson. I'm now pleased to uh, recognize uh, George Forsman, the uh, Deputy Assistant to the Governor for the Commonwealth uh, of uh, Virginia Preparedness. Also, I know that uh, my, my colleague, uh, Tom Davis, uh, recognized the former Lieutenant Governor, uh, John Hager, who is presently uh, Assistant to the Governor of Virginia for Community Preparedness. And I know you'll probably be leaving to go to Richmond from what I heard, but we're honored to have you with us here today too, sir. Thank you. Mr. Forsman. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman, members of the subcommittee. Uh, the opportunity to appear before this committee today, I think, is extremely important. Uh, I'm pleased to represent the Commonwealth of Virginia and to discuss the important issues of emergency preparedness in the nation's capital and in this region as a whole. The Commonwealth of Virginia and its Governor Mark Warner take the issue very seriously. In fact, Governor Warner established the Office of Commonwealth Preparedness as a cabinet-level office when he assumed office this year to provide the strategic focus to our preparedness efforts in terms of our coordination activities with communities, the private sector, our partners across the river in Virginia and the in Maryland and the District of Columbia, and to ensure that we add a strategic focus to our preparedness efforts. Uh, you noted Lieutenant Governor Hager is with us today. Much has occurred since this subcommittee held its hearings last October. In the weeks and months following the attack, there were those who sought to be critical of our preparedness and our response and recovery activities in the national capital region. This is unfortunate and does a disservice to the many men and women who work every day and were working prior to September the 11th to make the national capital region safer and more secure. I've been involved in public safety as both a first responder and at the executive level for nearly 25 years. I have never participated in a major crisis event in which there was a flawless response and recovery. Could we have done better on September the 11th and subsequently with the anthrax attacks? Absolutely. Did we fail? Simply stated, we did not. The structures have been in place for a number of years. What we found on September the 11th, what we found on uh, the subsequent days with, with the emergence of the anthrax crisis was that we needed to do a better job in terms of our execution. I think the good news in all of this is the fact that, uh, as you noted, Madam Chairwoman, you've brought a large group of folks to, together today. Uh, these folks have been working hand in hand, arm in arm, over the past 12 months to address the issues. The recent National Capital Region Summit involving Governors Warner and Glenn Denning, Mayor Williams and Governor Tom Ridge representing the federal executive branch, underscore the importance that leaders are placing towards National Capital Region preparedness. This summit and its eight commitments to action represent another step in the regional continuum for preparedness as they further are galvanizing our forward direction towards a higher level of preparedness. I would offer if there is one bright spot in the tragedy of September the 11th, it is the critical support that leaders at all levels of government in our communities at the state level and across the full breadth of the federal government, all three branches of the federal government and the private sector are focusing on preparedness. This level of leadership, support, and attention is critical to the role that we have to play. We cannot escape the simple fact that Washington is unique. Our founding fathers envisioned a nation where no one level or branch of government possessed supremacy over another. The checks and balances that our founding fathers provided to us make the whole business of coordinating preparedness, response, and recovery activities among the plethora of government entities in this great region a challenge. This means a structure that provides for effective coordination activities among local governments, states, and the district between the three branches of the federal government and, in fact, between both houses of the United States Congress, as well as our regional partners and our private sector partners. Our structures recognize that, or must recognize, for instance, that an attack, as demonstrated on September the 11th, can occur outside the geographical boundaries of the District of Columbia but nevertheless cause a significant impact on the nation's capital. There are many stakeholders that must be engaged in the decision-making process. I would offer to you, Madam Chairwoman, that I think that we have made substantial progress during the past 12 months, if for no other reason than we've raised the awareness on the part of officials, citizens, the media, and we know those areas that we need to address uh, corrective action. Um, I'd like to address one specific issue that you raised. You noted the fact that we have 17 jurisdictions uh, in what we commonly refer to as the National Capital Region. Our experience on September the 11th 
firmly indicated to us that the national capital region is much broader than 17 jurisdictions. It's much broader than the District of Columbia. It's much broader than two states. And it's clearly much broader than all of our private sector and our regional partners. So I would offer to you today that as we move forward with this continuum of preparedness, we are challenged to bring all of the stakeholders to the table to ensure that the plans, procedures, and processes work the next time, because we all know there will be a next time. Madam Chairman, you have my written testimony, and thank you very much. <clears throat> thank, you, thank you very much, Mr. Forsman. Uh, we'll now hear from uh, John R. DeRouge, Jr., Assistant Director, Response and Recovery Directorate of the Federal Emergency uh, Management Agency, FEMA. Did I pronounce your name correctly, yes, sir? Yes, ma'am, you did. Good, thank you. You're on. Hey, good morning, Madam Chairwoman and members of the subcommittee. Uh, it's an honor for me to represent uh, Director Albaugh at this very important hearing, and he asked that I extend his regrets that he could not be here with you this morning. For more than 20 years, the Federal Emergency Management Agency has been the nation's lead federal agency for preparing, responding, and recovering from emergencies and disasters, no matter what the cause. It is because of these unique capabilities that the President has incorporated FEMA as part of the proposed Department of Homeland Security that will have the principal mission in our government for protecting the American people and the security of our country. As you heard from my colleagues, even before the events of September 11th, FEMA was actively working with the District of Columbia and the state and local governments in the national capital region to help ensure our readiness to respond and manage the potentially devastating consequence of a terrorist event striking the heart of our government. In September of last year, our staff met with the planner from the D.C. Emergency Management Agency to develop a strategy to encourage involvement in the development of a comprehensive emergency response plan for dealing with terrorist incidents involving weapons of mass destruction. In the past year, the District of Columbia, FEMA, and the National Capital Region engaged in a comprehensive and coordinated planning process that should serve as a model for the nation. And I will tell you that there's been progress in a number of areas. First, the development of comprehensive response plans for terrorist incidents for the district and for the region, the identification of equipment needed to respond effectively, including better, more interoperable communication systems, training at all levels for responding to terrorist incidents, and operating in contaminated environments, and the establishment of a coordinated exercise program to improve response capabilities, practice mutual aid, and evaluate response operations. A number of actions were taken over the past year to improve the federal government's readiness to support the national capital region in the event of another terrorist attack. Among these include the development of a dedicated emergency response team for the National Capital Region, the development of specialized operating procedures for responding to incidents involving weapons of mass destruction, and providing technical assistance to the National Capital Region emergency planners, prepositioning critical resources, conducting seminars and workshops, and coordinating with other partners in the federal response community. The National Capital Region emergency response team is one of four highly skilled, specialized national teams to respond to the challenge of large, complex, catastrophic disasters. This team is dedicated to the national capital region. Not only are they skilled in the aspects of federal response, but in the unique challenges that face a response to the nation's capital. FEMA's National Emergency Response Team Contingency Plan for responding to terrorist incidents involving WMD incidents provides the national team with specific operating procedures that account for the unique contingencies and requirements of these events. I would suggest, suggest that these planning efforts might be a model for the rest of the nation, including the terrorism uh, specially prepared uh, training courses that uh, the, the district and the other uh, representatives here have participated in. Uh, Madam Chairman, I have my statement uh, abbreviated uh, but submitted for the record. And in closing, I just want to stress that, uh, as has been mentioned earlier, there has been a great deal of work done even prior to September the 11th. 
uh, accelerated, of course, since then. But I would also add that the process is a continuing one, it never ends, and requires a lot more work. Thank you very much, and I stand ready for your questions. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. DeRouge, and we're certainly we realize how important it is to have FEMA's uh, complete involvement. I uh, now recognize the Honorable Bruce Williams, who chairs the, uh, uh, the board of the Washington Metropolitan Council of Governments. He is also a council member in Tacoma Park, Maryland. Thank yes. you. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the subcommittee. As you know, COG is the 501c3 not-for-profit association of now 18 local governments in the metropolitan Washington region, serving Northern Virginia, suburban Maryland, and the District of Columbia. COG has served this region since 1957. First, I want to acknowledge the support of this committee in ensuring this region receive funds from the federal budget to improve the preparedness of the entire region after the terrorist attacks last year. Thank you. I'm pleased to report that COG and its many partners around the region have now completed work on what's likely a first in the nation regional emergency coordination plan. It's in printed form, 450 pages. We focused on one paramount goal, ensuring that the national capital region is prepared and equipped to respond to future emergencies or incidents, whether natural or man-made, domestic or foreign. The regional emergency coordination plan and its heart, the regional incident communication and coordination system are new regional tools that enable local, state, and federal government agencies and community and private sector organizations to better stand the challenges we now face and to remain vigilant. What makes this plan different, and why are we better off today than we were last year? First, the plan is a product of extensive and sustained engagement by key local, state, and federal government stakeholders, plus valued representatives of the private and community sectors. The plan addresses a broad spectrum of potential hazards and builds upon and recognizes the essential roles of local governments as first responders. The plan also recognizes the roles accorded to the states for emergency management and the unique responsibilities of the federal government in our region. The task force has organized the plan around emergency support functions, the key resources that will be needed in the event of an emergency or incident. In this regard, the plan reflects the approach of this federal response plan and many state and local plans in the region. Central to the entire plan is the Regional Incident Communication and Coordination System, or RICS. Mr. Williams, just move your mic a little closer. I can hear you, but I can see people oh. back there who are straining, too. Sorry. Thank you, but I could hear you. Central to the entire plan is the Regional Incident Communication and Coordination System, or RICS. Today, an emergency or incident would trigger a RICS conference call among key regional decision makers. Not some 10 hours after, as was the case on September 11th, following the attack on the Pentagon, but likely within 30 minutes in time to make a difference. RICS provides the technology and the procedures governing a notification system to alert local, state, and federal officials and important community and private sector representatives just minutes after an emergency or an incident. Notice will go out via telephone, pager, email, and other methods. COG and its partners have already begun to test the RICS making sure that players know their roles and can perform them quickly and effectively in an emergency or incident. We made significant progress in other major areas, including plans for the region's health and transportation systems during emergencies. As a result, the plan includes a draft operational plan for responding to a bioterrorism event, and we've worked with the region's major transportation authorities to develop a regional emergency evacuation transportation coordination annex and a communications process for the region's transportation agencies. Last week, the board adopted the plan, fulfilling a commitment made 11 months ago. We also capped our effort with a proposed MOU, which each of our member jurisdictions and partners is expected to sign to provide a mechanism to advance the plan. Further, partner agencies and organizations are asked to incorporate the plan concepts and agreements into their own plans, providing a seamless layer of preparedness and coordination for the national capital region. The plan will be subject to frequent and rigorous testing and evaluation testing of the RICS notification system began in June. This isn't the end of our work, but the beginning of a new phase guided by the preparedness and response blueprint we've developed for our, all of our uses. We've provided plan summaries to the committee, and we also have available the plan on CD-ROM, and it's also available on our website, mwcog.org. That concludes my, re my remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Williams. It is uh, kind of heavy lifting here, <laughs> that plan. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, and now I would like to recognize George Rattenberg, 
co-chair of the Emergency Preparedness Task Force of the Potomac Conference of the Greater Washington Board of Trade. And um, I think Bob Peck is probably around. I didn't see him, but I thought he might be with you. Okay, he's not here in absentia. Thank you, Mr. Brattenberg. Look forward to hearing from you, sir. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Uh, the Board of Trade is the only regional chamber of commerce in the national capital area and represents more than 1,300 of the largest businesses and nonprofit organizations in the area, employing 40 percent of the area's private sector employees. We appreciate your invitation to represent the private sector in front of this distinguished committee. I, the written testimony is submitted, and I will try and be brief in summarizing it. The national capital region in the District of Columbia is perhaps the politically and institutionally most complex region in the country, perhaps in the world. Uh, as the nation's capital, we have uh, not only three branches of government, two states, a federal district, 17 local jurisdictions, hundreds of federal and local agencies, 300 338,000 federal workers. There are over 2.7 million private sector employees uh, in the region who work in 235,000 businesses. Uh, 34,000 of those businesses are based in the district itself. The private sector is responsible for owning and operating over 80 percent of the private sector of the infrastructure in the region. The capital also draws 18 million visitors annually. The region is home to more than 60 colleges and universities with close to a quarter of a million students. The region also has more than 20 separate and distinct uniform police and federal protective service forces representing not only the federal government, each of the branches of the federal government, various constituent elements of the federal government, but local 17 jurisdictions. I'd like to focus this morning on three specific areas of concern about the state of planning in the region. Uh, first. Um, I would like to focus on whether or not we have uh, adequately uh, coordinated the effort on behalf of the whole region. Uh, all of the emergency management directors testifying here today are applauded for, should be applauded for their efforts to make their communities safer. But it is our experience that while a lot of planning is going on within uh, individual agencies and local jurisdictions, it is not as well coordinated across institutional boundaries and political jurisdictions as it should be. We need not just to make the dots stronger, but the links stronger. We meet, need not just to make the nodes stronger, but the networks uh, stronger. Uh, we have to find some simplifying mechanisms for planning in this region to deal with the regional institutional complexity. We have been participants now for almost a year with the Council of Governments Task Force uh, on the Homeland Security. Uh, it is under the excellent leadership of Carol Schwartz and staffed uh, by an extraordinary individual by the name of Michael Rogers and an extraordinary staff working for him. It has been broad, comprehensive, open, and inclusive, but it is by nature limited to what the constituent elements of its uh, constitutional force will permit it to do. It is made up of the representatives of 17 local jurisdictions in the states. But in fact, it is limited in terms of what it can do by what it is delegated by its constituent elements to do. Uh, they have set up uh, separate functional committees. They've invited the private sector into every one of those functional committees. We're represented and deeply integrated into the planning effort there. Having said that, we recently had a regional summit at which the two governors and the mayor of D.C. attended. Uh, and there wasn't reference by e any of the three of those to the COG process. And they have now established a separate process, uh, working under a steering committee at the regional level. Uh, and to date, it is not at all clear how that separate process, established by the governors and by the mayor, is going to work with the extraordinary efforts of the last year of the Council of Governments. And I think that is something that this committee should focus on and should press for in terms of simplifying the regional planning effort and to assure that the table uh, at the regional level is as simple but as comprehensive, open, and inclusive as possible. Second, we are concerned that after a year since the attacks, the overwhelming majority of the region's population simply does not know what to do in the case of a similar emergency. The public is asking, the private sector is, the private sector is asking, what's the plan? What's our role in it? What should I do to protect my family or business, to add strength to the regional plan, or to protect my kids and my workforce? Uh, clearly, we've established a color-coded system at the national level but there's no systematic guidance uh, to any of the constituent elements within the region, whether they be the public sector or the private sector or the public generally, as to what to do 
when at various levels of that color coding scheme. This question was recently raised on September 10 when the federal government issued a code orange. The Board of Trade received several calls from members asking what they should do and what we should tell our employees. To answer members' questions, we turned to federal and local agencies for guidance. None was received. It is our understanding that congressional staffers have not been briefed on evacuation or shelter-in-place plans. This is also true for the remaining 3.6 million people living in this region. Individual jurisdictions have taken, I think, pretty significant steps in trying to educate their citizenry within their particular jurisdictions. I'd particularly cite the efforts that Peter LaReport reported on and what he is doing inside the district. But there's no systematic regional uh, engagement of the public through the media on exactly what their role is and what their responsibilities are and what steps they should be taking to protect themselves. Our task force uh, at the Board of Trade actually has media representatives and they have offered their assistance uh, to uh, the public agencies in, in that effort. Last and finally, we need leadership. We need, need action. We must act as if our lives depended on effective collaborative action. In fact, our lives do depend on effective collaborative action in this region. We need to be confident enough to test our regional plans, to assess where they are weak, uh, and to communicate to the public uh, exactly how to make them stronger. Second, we need your support for Senator Sarbanes' amendment to create an office for the National Capital Region under the Secretary of Homeland Security. This amendment has broad bipartisan support. We encourage your leadership in keeping it in the final legislation as it goes through Congress. It is at least an effort to simplify the federal uh, families' participation in regional efforts. And on the regional side, as I said, we need your leadership to assure that the consolidation of both the regional summit process established by the governors and the mayor uh, and the COG process occurs and that the table include the public and the private sector as well. Thank you very much for the opportunity to share our concerns with you uh, today on behalf of the uh, private sector and the four million residents of this region. We have made some progress in the last year. We have a long way to go. This committee should be forceful and aggressive and constantly asking the question, what's the plan? Is the public aware of what the plan is? Are the private sector employers in this region aware of what the plan is and what their role is in it and how they can make it stronger? And this committee is one of those simplifying uh, catalytic agents that can force us to do a better job on behalf of our workforce, our citizenry, and on behalf of the citizens broadly of this region. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Bradenberg. I um, appreciate your testimony and, and the fact that you gave us an abbreviated version and posed some good questions. But just as you started talking, and I mentioned that Mr. Peck was not here, he showed up. So I did <laughs> want to recognize that, that Bob Peck, the president of the Greater Washington Board of Trade, is also uh, here with us. And now it's uh, my privilege to, uh, to turn the uh, uh, microphone over to uh, Dick White, who's the general manager of the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority. <clears throat> Good morning, Madam Chairman and uh, members of the subcommittee. I want to extend my appreciation to you for holding this hearing. <clears throat> As the transit provider for the nation's capital, <clears throat> Metro takes its responsibility in homeland security with the seriousness it demands. Met WMATA has been hailed by some as a national security asset, both for its efficient performance on that fateful day of September 11, 2001, and for its potential future role in moving people following a regional incident or emergency that requires evacuation. Because our service area is the national capital region, we recognize our special role in serving the federal government and the federal city. According to our recent statistics, nearly half of our passengers, 47 percent, during the morning and afternoon rush hours on our Metrorail system are federal employees. Of the 83 Metrorail stations, 35 are in close proximity to federal facilities. It is the reality that, given our location, we are a potential target in this high-risk area, and we must be concerned with protecting federal employees and others that use our system, as well as supporting the federal government's continuity of operations. We are pleased that an independent review of our security readiness has suggested that we are at least three years ahead of most transit systems in terms of security readiness. Im immediately after September 11th, the Federal Transit Administration conducted security readiness assessments for the 35 largest transit systems. Its key findings for the WMATA assessment, which are not information protected under confidentiality provisions, included the following. 
WMATA is critical to evacuation of federal employees and city residents. Coordination between WMATA and the federal government is critical during emergency operations. And redundancy and flexibility of WMATA operations are critical to handling emergencies. In your examination of the progress this region has made in developing emergency preparedness programs and in coordinating intergovernmental activities, I'll quickly touch on two areas as it pertains to our organization. Uh, the first is enhanced security and emergency response capability. In this regard, we have been focusing in three areas, target hardening, equipment and training, communications and information sharing. The federal government has made available $49.1 million to help support our efforts in this area. Of that amount, 40 percent is now currently obligated, and more than 90 percent will be obligated by the end of this calendar year. Uh, and my testimony gives great detail on what has been funded and the status of our investments in that regard. <clears throat> Turning to the second uh, topic, WMATA's intergovernmental focus has been oriented towards full participation in the Metropolitan and Washington Council of Government's Homeland Security Task Force. As described by Mr. Williams in his testimony, the COG has led this very complex region through an extensive collaboration planning process that covers communication, information sharing, and coordination activities before, during, and after a regional emergency. With respect to the transportation component of the regional plan, we have worked closely with COG to ensure that the many uh, scenarios being analyzed, such as an incident at a metro station, accurately reflect the short and long-term mobility implications for this region. <clears throat> we are particularly concerned if there is an incident that results in shutting down all or part of the metro rail system for an extended period of time. We are satisfied that COG has made a serious and substantial commitment of resources to the important issues of evacuation planning and that it will continue to complete uh, the real uh, difficult work that is now just beginning on really putting the, uh, on uh, defining the detailed aspects of an evacuation plan in order that we can better understand exactly how regional mobility will be impacted under various scenarios. We are also continuing our efforts to make sure that any federal agencies or others uh, who are relying on Metro for service in an emergency let us know of their special needs. This is the only way we can properly assess our service capacity and meet our commitment to support the early release or evacuation of employees as well as the continuity of operations of the federal government. In this regard, there is indeed an urgent need to provide financial assistance to support critical infrastructure protection and transportation capacity, as was suggested by Mr. Davis in his opening remarks. While we have had many discussions with the Office of Homeland Security and other federal agencies, which have indeed been involved in the COG planning process, we remain very concerned that there is no central point of contact within the federal government for this region. Given the unique and dominant federal presence in this region, coordination with the vast myriad of federal government agencies and entities in this region is absolutely critical to success of any emergency preparedness efforts. In the national capital region, the many branches and agencies of the federal government necessitate a single voice to aid and encourage the significant efforts already being taken under, underway by state, local, and regional authorities. The other area of concern is the highly decentralized nature of the executive budget branch budgeting process with respect to Homeland Security activities. Simply put, there is not a clear process or a point of contact for making federal funding requests, even when those requests are designed to implement the national strategy for combating terrorism in the national capital region. I was very pleased to see in your remarks, Madam Chairman, that you are supporting uh, the legislation, uh, uh, Senator Sarbanes' legislation, that amendment has passed the Senate. Uh, WMATA has issued a formal letter of support for this very important concept. I certainly hope the, the rest of your colleagues on this committee and the entire House of Representatives would uh, see their way to supporting uh, this amendment to the legislation. I believe it is essential. Uh, in conclusion, we look forward to continued discussions with the region, the administration, and the Congress on ways to continue to enhance our emergency preparedness, response, and recovery capabilities. We appreciate your leadership in this area and look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Mr. White. I'm now pleased to have the uh, chairman of the National Capital Planning Commissioner, uh, Commission testify, the Honorable John V. Cogbill III. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the subcommittee. I appreciate this opportunity to report to you on the Commission's security design work and our own contributions to the emergency planning efforts in the region. NCPC has been pleased to participate in the Regional Task Force on Homeland Security. 
We have welcomed the opportunity to assist the Metropolitan Council of Governments in applying geographic information systems technology to regional security issues. In March, we co-hosted with COG a forum on GIS security applications and have worked with the Council of Governments and Fort Belvoir personnel to evaluate GIS applications to advanced military tracking, communications, and mapping technology for civilian emergency response application. In this joint effort, we have been particularly interested in the effect of street closures on emergency operations. It is apparent that all block streets seriously impair evacuation procedures and circulation of emergency vehicles. As part of the Commission's extensive security design work during the past two years, we have consistently called for the reopening of closed streets wherever possible. Our participation on the Homeland Security Task Force has been undertaken in conjunction with the Commission's comprehensive urban design and security planning initiative. When I last appeared before you in November, the Commission had just released its recommendations concerning the impact of temporary security measures on the historic urban design of Washington's monumental core. At that time, I conveyed to you the Commission's serious concerns about the effect of closed streets, hastily erected jersey barriers, concrete planters, and guard huts on the National Mall. The Commission believes that such installations communicate fear and retrenchment and undermine the basic premise of a democratic society. Among its other recommendations, the NCP Security Task Force report under the leadership of Dick Friedman called for the preparation of a comprehensive urban design and security plan to provide permanent security and landscape improvements for Washington's federal buildings and historic public spaces. Based on these recommendations, the Congress appropriated $758,000 as part of the, the first anti-terrorism supplemental measure passed earlier this year for NCPC to prepare such a plan. Today, I am pleased to report to you that the Commission has all but completed our work on this plan. The National Capital Urban Design and Security Plan proposes a variety of solutions to seamlessly integrate building perimeter security while creating a more welcome and beautiful public realm. The plan demonstrates that good security and good urban design can go hand in hand. It is built upon the urban design framework that defines prominent districts and streets and recognizes that one size does not fit all in security design. It suggests instead design solutions tailored to particular precincts and provides much needed enhancements to our downtown streets. The urban design and security plan provides perimeter security against the threat of bomb-laden vehicles and offers a program of security and urban beautification and expands the palette of attractive street furnishings and landscape treatments that can provide curbside security. It presents a variety of security designs and solutions such as hardened street furniture, landscape planning walls, and sidewalk planners. We believe the result is far less intrusive, far more hospitable, and provides security that does not shout fortified street. The future use of Pennsylvania Avenue in front of the White House has been an issue of intense debate among Washington residents since its closure in 1995. The Commission examined closely state-of-the-art security technologies before concluding that leg legitimate security interests required that this portion of the avenue remain closed to traffic for the foreseeable future. We have studied the traffic impacts of the closure, analyzed potential tunnel alternatives, assessed a variety of transportation management strategies, and are now working with our planning partners to examine the feasibility of a downtown circulator system to ease cross-town traffic co congestion. We have worked hard to ensure that security in the nation's capital is achieved in a way that enhances the economic and cultural vitality of our city. The Urban Design and Security Plan offers solutions not only for Pennsylvania Avenue in front of the White House, but for the entire monumental core. The National Mall, Independence and Constitution Avenues, the Federal Triangle, Pennsylvania Avenue between the White House and the Capitol are all historic pre precincts that are today marred by a jumble of makeshift security barriers. Washington is one of the most admired capital cities in the world, and as good stewards, it is our responsibility to preserve the historic beauty for future generations of Americans. Since the release in July, our draft plan has been distributed to members of Congress and has been available for public comment. The Commission has evaluated the comments from the members of Congress, various organizations, and interested individuals, and will move forward, hopefully, with the final adoption of this plan in October. In conclusion, I would like to convey the Commission's deep commitment to this urgently needed security design work. Our effort has been collaborative in every sense. The plan is a result of all of the stakeholders, members of Congress, federal, federal and city officials, historic preservationists, business and community leaders, the professional planning and design community and security agencies finally coming together to make the difficult decisions 
and find the right balance between security and urban design that is worthy of the capital city of a great nation. I know you share our passion for this work that lies ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. This concludes my formal remarks. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Cog, Bill. Uh, now, uh, last, coming up, dealing with our federal employees, Scott Hatch, who is the Director of Communication for the Office of Personnel Management. Mr. Hatch. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee. On behalf of OPM Director Kay Coles Janes, uh, it is an honor to be before you today. September the 11th demonstrated that while the people of this region responded with a tireless commitment and compassion, the processes, technology, and protocols necessary to respond to a sudden emergency or terrorist activity are fundamentally different than those plans required for a weather-related incident. Until that day, regional communication and cooperation occurred in a timely fashion. For example, we could all track the snowstorms headed to our area. We knew when the protesters were going to be on D.C. streets. Officials had the luxury of time, in some instances days, to make a decision. 9-11 changed that. On that day, critical decisions had to be made in minutes, not hours, let alone days. OPM, FEMA, and the General Services Administration have developed what is known as the Federal Emergency Decision and Notification Protocol. That ultimately leads to Director James making the decision on the operating status of the federal government, GSA Administrator Stephen Perry determining the status of federal facilities, and FEMA Director Joe Albaugh's decision on the initial federal emergency relief response. These three individuals are charged with making some of the very first federal decisions in a national emergency, and this protocol puts them in immediate contact. And I might add that the process and technology are tested on a regular basis at the staff level and as recently as last week by the three directors. Once a decision is made, simultaneous calls will go out to the White House, the Office of Homeland Security, Metro, Mayor Williams' office, federal agencies, the Capitol Police, the Council of Government, Council of Governments and their excellent regional incident communications network, as well as to authorities in Maryland and Virginia. Director James' intent and desire, I might add, <clears throat> excuse me, is to provide as much lead time as possible to regional and city authorities in advance of an official decision. OPM fully understands that the influx of 180,000 federal employees would put a strain on any transportation system. But at the same time, we must have a dose of reality. No protocol, no matter how well thought out, can completely control everyone's actions. If the September 11th scenario played out again tomorrow in exactly the same fashion, there is no guarantee that people would not again flood the streets of their own volition. But if the same scenario did occur tomorrow, OPM, city, and federal officials would be in a much better position to communicate, coordinate, and provide protection for our citizens. Over two million people live and work in this region, and we owe it to them to get it right. And I thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Hatch, and I do have your uh Federal Emergency Decision and Notification Protocol before me, as do other members of the committee. Um, what I'm going to do, and I'm going to ask uh, my colleagues if we would confine our questioning to five minutes, and then we can maybe have about three rounds. Uh, and so I'll have the um, uh, recorder will be on there in terms of timing. So I'm going to ask each of you if you could briefly give me the status of preparedness in the national capital region on a scale of 1 to 10. How prepared is the region as a whole, as well as each locality? So if you could give me that number from 1 to 10. If it is pretty low, I'd like you to just briefly tell me what it is that you need. But let's, let's start off. Um, uh, we'll start off with you. Okay. If I was going to give it a number, I'd give it an 8. And it's a pretty high 8 but I think we've come such a long way in our connectability. If there's a concern to get to 10, part of it is continue to the investment in technology, the investment in sustainability of the effort that's been going on. Okay, very good. All right, uh, continuing on, um, you did very well, Mr. Laporte. And 
Yeah, uh, I guess I would probably Mr. give it Kelson. A, a seven. Yeah. Excuse seven. Me, seven for the region. Okay. Uh, I think there's uh, a lot of investment that's been made. Uh, I think the, the basis for really uh, preparedness is the emergency management functions. Uh, funding has been at a level for 10 years without any increase in emergency management performance grant, which is the infrastructure upon which preparedness is based. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, do you have something like this in Maryland? Are localities doing that? Uh, yes. My Montgomery County, for example, that? has a, an extensive uh, document for the public. Mm -hmm. right. Very good. Okay, moving on, Mr. Forsman. Madam Chairwoman, the, the danger is if I give you the wrong number, how does that affect our federal funding? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, I think the simple fact uh, is I would I would give it a seven as well and and the two areas where clearly we need to uh, do a much better job on the integration piece of it is citizen awareness and education because ultimately government and the private sector and in all levels of government can make decisions but until the citizens uh, play their roles out we're not going to be fully prepared and I, I fundamentally think we're going to have to grasp the whole issue of critical infrastructure protection and fully engaging our private sector partners because we do the, the response side of it we can do. The critical infrastructure protection is going to be a challenge. Mm -hmm. Sounds a little bit like a uh, refrain from Mr. Uh, Bradenburg, too, as a matter of fact. Thank you. Um, Mr. Uh, uh, Darouche? I would, I would tend to concur with the, the, A little, little closer to the microphone. I would tend to concur with uh, something between uh, a six or a seven at this point, and I, I think uh, although there have been great strides, as I mentioned in my comments, the whole notion of, of planning what are you is gonna a never-ending uh, requirement. I mean, as you exercise, you adjust. As, as threat changes, you adjust. Uh, and we're in the process of assessments to determine needed equipment uh, to accommodate the response and recovery business. So I would say somewhere between a six and a seven is uh, lots of work has been done, no question, but there still remains a great deal of work to be done. Mm -hmm. Be interested a little later, or maybe even in writing, if you could even give us more specificity about besides just, you know, making sure that we continue to, to work together um, as we begin to update. Great. Um, Council Member Chair Williams? I'd go along with the seven. It's been my experience as we've gone through our long process that, as in many things, the more questions you ask, the more questions arise. We've had any number of areas where we feel very proud of what we've done, but there are whole areas, whole annexes in the plan that are noted where we basically say this, this area remains for extensive work. Uh, one of them that we call out in there is uh, debris management, uh, where we just haven't had the area of specificity that we do with some of the other I would also, uh, in response to Mr. Vredenberg's comment earlier about uh, getting word out to the public and making sure that they understand this whole process, that we now feel like we, we have something to present to the public and we're ready to do that. We've started uh, taping shows to go out to the various public access channels to make sure that we share this plan with the public, but there's still a lot that remains to be done and uh, the our ability to fund that is uh, limited by what we can get from other levels of the government. You, you also had a good point that you made earlier dealing with uh, how does the Council of Government, I mean, where is the Council of Government when you had the, mem the uh, uh, Memorandum of Understanding with the two, uh, uh, two governors and the mayor? That's something maybe right. at some point we can try to address. We've, we, and we, we have uh, worked with that. We uh, met with the uh, chief of staff of the governor in Annapolis on uh, Monday, and we're going to meet with uh, folks in Richmond, and we'll continue to make yeah. sure that we coordinate. So you're moving along in that regard? Yes. Uh, very good, because that was a concern that uh, we had. Mr. Bradenburg, my time is almost running up, so... Uh, I would rate it between four and five, and I would say, four and five, and I would say uh, one of your problems is that you don't have a single person to ask that question. You don't have a single person who you can say, how does it balance security versus openness, which was uh, Congresswoman Norton's question at the outset. You don't have a single person to do it, and you don't have any metrics. You don't know what it means to be ready, and you don't have any improvements uh, or standards by which you're going to be measuring this. And we haven't tested, we haven't tested whatever plan we have. So we don't have a metric, we don't have a test, and we don't have a single place to look. 
Uh, and I would say, from the public's point of view, they have no clue. I don't think no, they, they would even know how to answer that question. Mm -hmm. Is it a good first step, that uh, Sarbanes Amendment? It does simplify, or at least seeks to simplify, the federal family conversation. The COG process simplifies the regional conversation, and if the two were married, you would think there's a single table that was open to all. Mm -hmm. Okay, Mr. White, can I just finish with that? Okay. Uh, Madam Chairman, I would rate it about a six. Uh, I think there's a tremendous amount of coordination uh, work that has been done. I would, uh, I would associate myself with the comments that we don't have a good regional and public understanding uh, of the work that has been done, and that's certainly the next uh, part of the effort that needs to be done. Uh, critical infrastructure is a, a real consideration, power communications, transportation. I'm, of course, very concerned about the limitations of our transportation network and our limitations of our road and, and transit capacity. It's awful on a good day. And the third one is I would associate myself with Mr. Vandenberg's comments about complete and uh, full uh, federal uh, participation with the single point uh, of contact. Mm -hmm. Great, good. Uh, Mr. Cogbell? Yes, ma'am. From a fairly rarefied uh, planning environment here in the, in the district and in, in the region, I would say about a seven. The, the problems I continue to see are really on the technical levels. Uh, GIS, the using of that technology and, and some of the communications. But certainly from our perspective, the planning is, is something we've done regularly and we've had good working relationships with all of our colleagues and we see this as coming along, but obviously not there yet. Thank you. Mr. Hatch. I'll restrict my, uh, <clears throat> my view to, to what OPM is, is primarily concerned about, and that, that is the decision uh, of the status of the federal government and the, the coordination of the communications. And in that area, I would have to give it an eight. Uh, I would probably give it higher, but, but there's always more room to improve. Uh, the coordination of the communication effort of all the federal, state, and local uh, municipalities and administrators has been exceptional over the last year. Uh, in our books, we have the phone number, every conceivable way to reach any key decision maker in this region. And uh, from that standpoint, uh, I feel that, that we are fairly well prepared in the area of communication and notification. Mm -hmm. And do the, uh, do the employees, federal employees, know what you've been doing? Yes, ma'am. Uh, we've been working in adequately. addition uh, with the Office of Homeland Security, uh, developing a protocol to uh, uh, take the notification and decision process to the chiefs of staff of all the federal agencies and then to begin the training within each of the agencies with the security personnel. Mm -hmm. Okay. I want to thank you all very much. I now defer to Ms. Norton for her questioning. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. If I, if, if I may say so, first of all, I, I, it's interesting to see you all giving yourselves such high marks. I, 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 you know, I'm, 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 I'm still a tenured professor of law at Georgetown, and I do mark on the curve. <laughs> uh, uh, and marking on the curve, considering from whence you have come, uh, I can understand uh, your marks. Um, let me just say for the record that the size of this panel uh, I think is the best evidence of the need for the new office. We considered, uh, staff tells me, dividing this panel up, and we said we can't because they have to be able to respond to one another. And in 12 years on this committee, I have never had, I've never sat with a panel this large where, where, where that was absolutely necessary to get the kind of information we need. Um, if, if one wants to talk bureaucracy, one has to talk about what, what you all have to do to find a single point of contact. That's bureaucracy. It, 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 the, the kind of office that is being proposed in the Sarbanes the Senate, the, the Senate amendment, of course, gives you that point of contact. It's not a bureaucracy. It's a person there with, of course, uh, maybe a few people to help them. Uh, but when you consider what we have with traffic in this, in, in this town, when we try to figure out what to do to relieve uh, what happens on the roads coming in and out with three independent jurisdictions running around trying to figure it out, I should think that the experience now of decades doing that would be its own uh, comment on what, what's needed here. I'm going to try to I'm, I hope we can get from this hearing what maybe the average citizen would want to know and hasn't had an opportunity to find out. So I'm just going to ask questions that I think might occur to some of them. Um, and, you know, let me start with Mr. Um, 
uh, Daju, am I? Daruj. Daruj, yes, ma'am. If someone came up to you on the street, and anyone else who may have an opinion here, I, I'd, I'd invite to respond, and said, Mr. Daruj, uh, I live uh, in um, Montgomery County, or uh, and work in D.C., or I live in D.C., um, what's the best way for me to know if an attack has occurred? What would you, how would you respond, sir? Well, first of all, I would say that the, typically an, an attack occurring would certainly be something that uh, would be broadcast through emergency uh, channels and the, and the national and local news media. I'm sorry. Uh, as I was saying, I, something of that nature would, of course, be broadcast through emergency channels immediately. Well, and let me just stop you there, because I think it's very important for people to know there's nothing fancy happening here. That the first thing to, to, to know is that this, 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 we are all wired up in this country and probably in the rest of the world. So to, to, to relieve people from believing, and I do think you're right, Mr. Vatterberg, people don't have a clue. They think really something very special has to happen. You have to be somebody special. That the way in which in this country almost everybody finds out anything is through uh, the usual media. I, 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 because I don't have but so much time, I want to go on the metro. Um, um, what to do? when it comes to an attack, whether to move at all. I hear everybody talking about evacuation. Uh, somebody better tell people, uh, stop, look, and listen before you run. I've had people in DC say, hey, look, they're getting everybody else out of town. How do we get out of town? As if perhaps they may be in the safest place uh, in, in, in the region. That, because because so many of your answers have had to have be abstract, and because I'm I'm used to the case method, let me let me give you a case. Listen, let me give you a case you have. September the 11th. Now, given September the 11th, had you been prepared? Should you have told people, the OPM, I want whoever thinks they can answer this, to get in your cars? If you had told, should you have told everybody to get on the subway? Could Mr. White have handled that? If everybody had left their cars and gotten on the subway on September the 11th, knowing now what you know, what should OPM have told federal employees, workers, federal and non-federal, to do in the district, those in the District of Columbia? Delgad Norton, I'll be uh, happy to at least start the discussion. And, and may I first say that uh, you've been gracious through the years by appearing on television programs on C-SPAN that I've produced, and you've uh, allowed to come on the program many times at the last minute. So I'm uh, very happy to, uh, to be here today. Uh, September 11th, of course, very unusual in our, in our lifetime. Hopefully, it'll never happen again. Uh, by the time- And by the way, I wish people would stop saying because you know the whole the public thinks when and everyone says it from the president on down and i'm here to tell you it will happen again thank you very much i don't think you have to keep reminding people of that uh and people believe it's kind of a cover your butt statement of officials so that when it happens nobody will say we didn't tell you so meanwhile you know what do you think you do to people visitors coming to the district of columbia visitors getting on airplanes you know, the last thing they heard <laughs> was that somebody uh, told them that it was going to happen again. I wonder if they mean it's going to happen today when I have to get on this plane to go to Houston. So could we stipulate for the record <laughs> that it will happen again and nobody needs to tell us all and remind us all that it will happen again? Yes, sir. You mentioned earlier that uh, the best place to be might be remaining where you are. And that was on our minds at OPM and OPM Director Should James. Could that have happened? On, I'm trying to, I'm trying to yes. see if there is a problem-solving approach to an incident. Should that have been uh, what people were told on September the 11th? In my view, yes. By 945, uh, the streets in Washington, D.C. were clogged. That was well in advance of a notification at 10.08 a.m. that federal employees 
may leave their buildings. They were never instructed that they had to leave because, as you rightly mentioned a moment ago, many times the safest place might be or the most convenient place might be where you are. Uh, in retrospect, the decision would have been called the same way today. Um, Mr. Mr. White, <coughs> people really didn't know whether to take their cars if they had ridden them or to crowd your trains. I think um, there's a very uh, strong relationship between the decision of what people do with the school system and the decision of what employers do with employees. And what we saw on the 11th was a, uh, you know, a major disconnect between those two. Human nature being what it is, no matter what OPM tells uh, an employee to do, if their uh, schools are releasing, if they have school-aged children, they're going to go take care of them. And that was a major disconnect that drove a lot of chaos uh, in the region. Uh, I think everybody went home the way they came in. So, I mean, if they drove, they drove. If they took Metro, they took Metro. Uh, but, Ms. Norton, if, you know, if, if the strategy is to tell everybody who drove in, uh, don't leave your car behind and get on Metro, we can't handle it. We absolutely, uh, fundamentally but cannot you see, you handle that. you heard what Mr. Hatch said. He said maybe the thing to say is stay where you are. Stay in place is... Until you uh, hear more from us. The, the experts who talk about the issue uh, of uh, evacuation always caution the people who talk about it. Uh, don't call it evacuation because this is an issue of uh, what do we do with the movement of people based upon the conditions that are in front of us. And in many instances, uh, protect in place, I think is the terminology that is used, is the best strategy. And that can only be done if everybody gets instant access to the best information they possibly can about what they should do and what their choices are. And I think that's a, that is a fundamental part of this uh, evacuation plan, at least the COG is still calling it the evacuation plan. Uh, that's an important part of it. It's called a part of the demand management strategy. It's not always about moving people, it's about managing demand, including protect in place. Um, Mr. Laporte, you'd wanted to talk, respond? I, I want to compliment Metro as well as uh, OPM, but what we really want to do is to get accurate information to those people who are leaving the city. If we could make sure if the 14th Street Bridge is closed or if Constitution between 15th and 17th are closed, that those people who are leaving their buildings are empowered with that knowledge so they can seek that alternative route. And that's the key is our education as we continue to work with our, the federal employees to expedite their commute. Really want to be careful of the, uh, as you said, the evacuation word. Because when you talk about evacuation, there's 580,000 people who live in town. Um, evacuation is moving those people who commute here in an expedited way home to their respective uh, homes in Maryland and Virginia. But for those folks who live in town, it really is a challenge as where do we go? So the idea of sheltering in place is key to understanding what protective actions are best to take and, and really emphasizing that, that is all part of our personal preparedness, the community-based approach, the schools, universities, business industry, to educate on a simple collective level of protective actions, Maryland and Virginia and the district, accepting some common language collectively so when we give out those protective action guidelines, there's consistency among all three jurisdictions. Anyone else have a response, Mr. I'll just make a quick comment, Congresswoman Norton, because you have asked a question that probably should have been asked, you know, six months ago, nine months ago, the like. And I'm not sure that your question to this panel doesn't reflect the, one of the problems here is that these, all of us still have not exercised the scenario of what we would have done differently on 911 and whether we've got the systems in place to have done something differently on 911. You've asked what seems to be a simple, straightforward, citizen oriented question, and I'm not sure that you're getting a better answer today. You're getting different answers, but is this whole system going to respond in a way? that people, if they hear from their employer and from the media that they should stay in place, will they trust it? Will they, in fact, respond in the way you want them to respond? And the only way we're going to know that is if we, in fact, go through some scenarios and, in fact, have a trusted system uh, so the public knows what the plan is, they trust that somebody is on top of the best information they can have, they're getting the best communications, their kids are protected in schools, their employers know exactly what's going on, and therefore they will take the behavior that we would want them to take in order to protect 
the large body of citizenry and workforce in this region? And you've asked a critical question. I'm not sure you're getting a real good answer from us. And I include I, me. I, I recognize we are, we, you know, we're all involved in our own learning curve, but if, if I may say so, I believe we've already, um, we've already have a, pro a, a problem given the answers. There seems to be a consensus that to run may be the worst thing to run out into the bioterrorism, you know, run, run out into uh, danger, or even if there's no danger, all run out at the same time and you create your own danger. There seems to be a, a, a consensus as we, as we take a case in point, yes, a scenario, that the best thing to do is not to evacuate. Yet the only thing residents hear is about evacuation plans. I can assure you that in this building, everybody is going to jump up and run. And <laughs> so since language is everything, well, let me suggest, and God knows I'm not sure what the right words are, that we need to wipe the words evacuation plan from the dictionary as far as response to terrorism concern. I mean, here's, here's a try, it, it, and it's not good enough. Attack response plan. We've got to now begin educating people. We've got to uh, unlearn the evacuation notion. Everybody's got that, you all. Boy, have they got that. First, they got it by instinct, and now they've gotten it from all of us. How do we now tell them that we don't mean for them to run until they listen? We, we need a stop look and listen plan. Uh, and if I could just ask from this moment on, and this is why we need this new office, because everybody obviously is in his own bailiwick trying to figure out what to do, um, uh, to, to begin the process to educate the, pu the public that the worst thing to do may be to evacuate where they happen to be. Stop, look, and listen, and you will learn what to do. From the point of view of, of Mr. White, it may be that the last thing you should do is to have a car out we may be able to sequence people out of here if, in fact, people know, all right, I mean, literally it is possible even on a mass society to say everybody below D Street can now go home. Everybody above that, that it would be dangerous to go out there. People will follow instructions, but only if they understand they're not in danger if they don't evacuate now. Uh, Madam Chair, I'm over my time. Ms. Watson. Thank you so much, Madam Chair, for having this hearing. And I want to thank the presenters, too. We are learning a lot from you. I was particularly intrigued uh, by the comments from uh, Mr. George Vandenberg. And I think he gave this process the lowest score. And um, in listening to your comments, uh, I saw in front of me uh, what is called the Regional Emergency Coordinated Plan. And I also have a copy of a Family Preparedness Guide. Uh, can I hear comment not only from you, Mr. Vandenberg, but from the other members of the panel as to whether these two guides will serve people at a time of emergency? Uh, I thought they looked pretty good. Uh, the only thing that I have not heard from anyone on the panel, and uh, D.C. is a district that has many waterways. What do we do about the waterways? And uh, would they be an escape hatch? And maybe somebody could address that. Uh, also, and I'm just throwing these thoughts out, and uh, there are a couple of people that I wanted to address them. The other person was uh, John Coghill. And... Um, I am looking at these two manuals, and I'm saying they look pretty complete, but not complete enough. And uh, I wanted to know if the Homeland Security Department that's being proposed is the giant umbrella that will coordinate all that you're doing. I heard very clearly Mr. Vandenberg said there's no one person you call, no one department, and so on. Uh, right now, I don't think Homeland Security Agency is the answer. What I would do if anyone cared about my single opinion 
is I would have put another secretary level person in the White House that would coordinate each one of uh, your uh, departments, agencies, or whatever, and answer to the President and Congress. One person you could call that could tell you what's happening here, 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 and here. I don't think coordination is adequate. Uh, I can tell you on 9-11, we were right in the Capitol. No one knew anything, not even the media. They were asking us. We knew the least. They were yelling to us, get out, get out, get out, run, 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 run across the grass, run across the barrier. I didn't know where to go. I was concerned about my staff. I had my chief of staff with me, and uh, I couldn't get any information. And so as we were walking the streets, people standing out in front called us in, come in, Congresswoman. There's a phone, television. I didn't even know what had happened. I had not seen it. and so. I started calling around. I called my office in Los Angeles to tell them that we were okay, but I don't know where the staff is. And they said, well, why don't you call the national police? And that's what we did. And they said, we'll pick you up right now. When they came to pick me up, it was in a canine unit, and my chief of staff couldn't even go with me. He had to walk. So I'm just saying it was chaotic. And we all got together. Everybody was emotional, and there was a lot of shouting and yelling. And we said, what we need is an evacuation plan. So I say that to say, how are you coordinated with the Hill and with us? I haven't heard that yet. And so I'd like to hear first back from Mr. Vandenberg and then with Mr. Coghill, because you're heading up this National Capital Planning Commission. And how do we bring the Capitol Hill together with the region and the people? I am a great believer, uh, Ms. Watson, in um simple communications. Uh, and Ms. Norton's notion of a stop, look, listen plan is something that will stick in people's head and cause them to pause and then to listen before they take action. So as good as these are, and I'm not saying they're not high quality, uh, well written, and to the extent that they're actually read, integrated into people's lives, terrific. My own sense is that we need some very simple convenient, easy-to-use mechanisms for the public to understand what to do. Stop, look, and listen. Turn on your TV set. If for some reason the broadcast stations aren't operating, turn on your radio and listen. And you will hear within 15 minutes of an attack the most recent information known to public officials in the region and the steps to take and when they can receive another update. So, uh, that, let me just so that the public... Here. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Yeah, let me just intervene here. You're absolutely correct. We didn't know. We went into the National Police Headquarters and we heard from the CIA, the FBI, the Capitol Police, and they didn't tell us any more than we could get on CNN. Well, that is why it's, we have offered, because the private sector task force of the Greater Washington Board of Trade does have the local and national media on it, we have offered uh, to work with public affairs officials or public information officers to develop the kind of very simple set of communication steps that we ought to be taking. Clearly we need a clear authoritative voice for the region, not just perhaps the president or a cabinet official on what's happening to the nation, but for the region. These are the steps. What's happening to your schools? What's, happ what's happening? Are we closing or opening the schools? What steps should you take uh, in perhaps different sections of the city? What do you do about different languages to assure that all non-native English language speakers also get a communication? When is your next update? If you don't have authoritative information at 9.45, you wait to 10.08, the streets are clogged, you're too late already. You've got to be out there almost immediately saying precisely what Ms. Norton said, which I thought was really intriguing. Stop, look, listen, turn on a TV set, the TV for some reason is down because the towers are out in the town, turn on your radio. If those are out, do some other mechanism, but in fact uh, have an authoritative voice very quickly establishing what's happening, uh, what steps to take, and when the next update. So the people will wait this. 15 minutes or half an hour for the next update. Mm -hmm. Do we need a 911 for a 911 type event? I, I'm afraid that the communication system may be clogged because it's built for only 
you know, a certain percentage of people using it at a point in time, but we do have a wide variety now of communications mechanisms. We have obviously TV, cable and broadcast, we have radio, we also have the internet, but speak we have back wireless. To you. Speak back to you. Um, some can, some can't. Uh, and so if we integrate our communications to the public so that you can go on your local TV set, the stop, look, and listen for more details, go to internet site A, or call a particular number, but you'd have to, I think, begin to think through how you could have different communications at a point in time so that, in fact, you didn't clog your system because then no one would hear it. But if, in fact, it was just stop, look, and listen, update in one half hour, do not move for one half hour, um, then you would have some mechanism by which the public could uh, understand and not take the most immediate intuitive reaction, which is to run. Ms. Watson, would I, you? I don't know if uh, the Internet will serve all people, right. particularly Ms. Norton, in your district, there are too few people that have access to computers and all. Uh, what I am latching on to, something you said, a very simple way, and as I said, if we could get two-way communication with a human being, you know, on the other end, I hate these numbers that you call and you keep getting a recording and you got to go through a list of 10 things and you're not sure if you push a button, you're going to get the right area you want. And I don't know if we have that kind of time. So I wasn't just being flippant when I said a 911 number for a 911 situation. I was thinking, because I've heard several of you say if we had one point uh, that we could communicate with, maybe we could get a clear message. I could ask you a question. You know, I have 10 people and I have one car. Can I call a taxi or is there a van that can pick us up and move us to a safer ground? Um, this is something, the coordination is what really bothers me because we've experienced an uncoordinated kind of response. Um, and so, you know, you might not have the answers, but think about the question. Well, Ms. Watson, Ms. Watson you do highlight the value of a lot of pre-event thinking about yeah. the subject so that we don't think about this on the moment of the attack. We think about this well in advance of this and perhaps organize ourselves by blocks, by other organizational elements within this community so that everyone is not calling one number, but one knows precisely what number to call uh, and so that we can get a response system that is responsive to people and giving them comfort that they know what is happening, what they should do to protect themselves and their families. But this is a lot of planning beforehand. It requires deep engagement, I think, of all aspects of the media up front in a planning sense so that we do know almost intuitively and reactively what to do when an attack ha hits. We know there are two things we should do. We should turn on our radio or TV, and we should call our local block captain. So there's only a couple things to do, and at that point, you can distribute the information through those mechanisms. Something that we have done as politicians uh, that has been very effective, we send out these little stickums, and you can stick them on your telephone or on your refrigerator or on your television, giving emergency numbers. And I'm sitting here thinking that uh, we need to have a way for the people to get questions and not have to sit in front of a television set because I was on foot. I didn't see a television set until I went into someone's home. Uh, but I knew something was going on. Could we have a line, could we have telephone lines dedicated with people, you know, rushing to a center, getting on those lines, giving the most current information? Where do you go? Uh, we on the freeways in California have these uh, bo boxes, emergency boxes, and you can, if your car stops, and they're like every quarter of a mile, you go, you pick it up, and there's someone on the other side of that line that can answer your questions or get you the kind of help you need. You know, what do we need? You don't need to answer. I'm throwing these questions out. Let me go now to Mr. Coghill. I was very uh, compelled. The young lady's time is expiring. Has expired. Can I have one half a second? Huh. <laughs> uh, about the uh, blockades, and I've listened to Ms. Uh, Norton over the year about the way the city looks, and I know I get frustrated coming into the Capitol in the morning, you know, with all these barricades. We, too, have to stop 
flip the hood, all of that. And uh, it's very unseemly. And I know there are many, many people that uh, look at the district today and really don't want to visit because it looks like an armed camp. And I was very uh, compelled by your testimony, Mr. Coghill, and maybe you want to comment on it. Yes, ma'am, I'll, I'll try to be very brief. First, we, we do serve a very limited role in the planning uh, in, within the district and in the, the capital region. But certainly, our, our emphasis has been on, on reducing the appearance of Washington as a fortified city. I would uh, take this opportunity, though, to mention a couple of other things and some of the positive things that I think that I personally experienced on 9-11 here in Washington. And one of those was coming out of the building onto the street and finding that every person I, I've encountered made eye contact. And for the first time in a long time in a large metropolitan area, I found that people were looking at each other. They were communicating with each other. And that, that is something I hadn't experienced for a long time. Also, as I was leaving the city with my son, we, we found people on the side of the road who were, who were standing there, and people stopped to pick them up and take them with them. So the people reached out and helped each other during that time. And we came together better as a nation on that day than, than any day that I can remember in recent history. What has National Capital Planning Commission done? Well, we have looked to the future as much as we can through our legacy plan. And one of the things you mentioned, we're using our waterways to get people around the city. And one of the things that we have proposed are water taxis. Now, this is not something that will happen today or tomorrow, but we need to believe that the waterfront needs to be better utilized. We need to know that people can move around through this area using this wonderful facility that once was an artery and did move people around. And so this is what we have proposed. As, as you may know, the, the Kennedy Center renovations that, that are now proposed and have just been funded are, in fact, part of the same legacy plan. And what we're trying to do is to look ahead. We're looking at improving the transportation links in and out of the city. As you know, with, with the water bodies we have, there are limited means to get in and out of the city across the bridges. These, these are points that you cannot expand in, in, in a crisis. These are, these are facilities that are limited in, the, in what they can carry. But we also believe that by, by proper planning, by proper transportation planning, by improving the ways across the Anacostia, by improving the, the, the network of, of transportation facilities and improving the public transportation system in the district, that we can make our contribution to the National Capital Planning Commission to the, to the objectives that you have just described. Thank you. We've extended the time, as you can see, because you all had such great answers, and, and the, issue, the whole issue is so very important. I do want to reiterate what I said at the beginning, and that is that I know I have a number of questions I want to ask. I know Ms. Norton does and Ms. Watson, and so if we may also submit some questions to you, too. Mr. Laporte, I know you were very frustrated there because when the discussion was about call WTOP or 911, you already have some of that. Um, in your in your pamphlet here, I noticed that. But Mr. Radenberg, uh, you e testified in terms of the cooperation between business entities in Montgomery County as partners in the early stages of uh, emergency planning and its effectiveness. Uh, how how can we institutionalize this business partnership in our region? And, and I would also like to ask uh, FEMA. Uh, uh, Mr. DeRouge, uh, to report back to this subcommittee, if you could do that by October 10th, uh, on how this approach is being incorporated in the uh, regional federal uh, contingency plans. We'll be happy to do that. Good. Anybody want to comment on, on the question of uh, the um, business entities and yes, Mr. Laporte. We, as the we, the district received uh, quite a bit of funds from this committee. Uh, last year, one of the investments was with business and industry, because it's a key component uh, of getting those folks empowered with the knowledge of our plans, but also to develop their own plans and how they work. And we've been working with the Board of Trade and the Chamber of Commerce to get the word out to these trainings, and we're sharing that the curriculum with Maryland and Virginia to make sure it's disseminated even further. Uh, what we're finding is that there's a great deal of interest in our plans, but even more importantly, though, is their own plans, their own plans for their own employees, the responsibilities that business want to take upon themselves. We're finding a great deal of interest in that. But not just the business community, there's a unique uh, interest in the churches and the, the religious community here in town. And taking advantage of that, there's addi additional curriculum of investing in those 
those civic associations who really have roots in our neighborhoods. Because in many, many ways, disasters happen locally and response happens locally. And in the district, as we get out to the boating community, or if we get out to, to different wards, and we're doing community training in, throughout the wards about our, our plans and, and their own plans, it's about personal preparedness, and it really does start at home. And driving in that, that, that important fundamental foundation of taking the responsibility on themselves to become empowered with the knowledge, but also to share that with, throughout their civic association. With the business community, we've found it, an appetite that we can't match. We, the, they're sold out. They're filling up. We've got wait, waiting lists of hundreds of businesses. So as we go forward, sustaining this level of preparedness in the national capital region is going to take those additional funds because the commitment to really reach the special communities that we have is uh, quite challenging. Do you believe that the uh, typical business uh, owner knows what to do in the event of a code orange? We're finding that um, the, the larger companies have made that investment. The real challenge is the small and medium businesses who really are, their profit levels are such that they're working. And until you, until you can put it in a profit type argument and explain to them it's a worthwhile investment. The levels of uh, color co codedness have caused some degree of confusion because of the change, what did it mean? Here in the National Capital Region, it certainly took on a heightened uh, alert when the Department of Defense took additional action. It certainly asked, everyone asked a lot of questions about the level of coordination, what we were looking at. Um, we're continuing to work on that. The public education of that is critically important. And there are some really good examples of how the color codedness of the preparedness match up with what businesses can do, what schools can do, what universities can do, and we're working on that throughout our training. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Then we still have a way to go, and I, I have a little bit of time left, so I'm wondering about uh, how is the level of preparedness being assessed, um, and does this assessment differ on a regional and local basis? So looking also at what standards do you use, national standards, local, I would ask anyone who would like to respond to that. And I know, Mr. Williams, I'd like to give you a chance to make any, a brief comment that you had been trying to make, if you'd like to. If that doesn't disrupt the continuity of standards and assessment, you may if, make it. If I can do that now, I'd appreciate it. Um, I've, I've just been a little frustrated. I think that the conversation that we had uh, starting with the response to Ms. Norton's question and continuing with Ms. Watson's question, lost point, lost sight of the most important thing that I th think is an answer to that that we just didn't get to. That in terms of what's different today than on September 11th, what would we do differently and how would people get the information that they need, how would we react, that the thing that we have today that we didn't have then is the regional incident communication and coordination system. We have a way for the important people who have the information for the decision makers to get together quickly and confer and come out with proper information that is accurate that people will need so that you're always going to have to go to a diversity of sources to get the information. There is no one simple answer for everybody, and there is no one place where everybody can go and get their questions answered because it would be overwhelmed immediately. So that that system is going to put out to the media, to local governments, to whoever, it's going to put out the best information possible. And I think if we, if we get tied up in thinking that we haven't come up with a new mechanism and a way to get that information so that people know what to do that's different from September 11th, we'll have lost sight of a lot of progress. Madam Chairman, I'd, I'd like to address the, the whole issue of performance management and poor performance measurement. Uh, I think, and in, in it's incumbently clear, to, or abundantly clear to me today, that um, we need to do a better job of educating because some of the issues that we've just spent a time talking about, dialogue about, uh, in fact, you know, it really boils down to, to just what Mr. Williams said. Uh, should we have been able to do that collaboration? Absolutely. Should we have implemented the emergency alert system, which is fundamentally the, the system to get the word out to the public? We should have. Did we not use it on the 11th? No, we didn't. Uh, so that was clearly a failure on the part to use existing systems. Um, but with regard to the standards issues, uh, I think if you look at the national standards for what does uh, an accredited 
emergency management capability look like in a local jurisdiction? What does it look like at the state level? What should it look like at the regional level? There are national standards, and we should be seeking to achieve those national standards because that That's takes the into EMAP. Is that no, no ma'am. No, the, oh, EMAP. Yes, yeah. yes ma'am. And, and it seeks to take into account everything from command and control to effective utilization of the emergency alert system to uh, decision, uh, decision processes for expedited, since we're not going to use the term evacuation, expedited movement of people out of the area to protective action recommendations to stay in place. And I think the simple fact is we're going to spend millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars in this region uh, in the next 10 years. And unless we're seeking to uh, obtain a measurable end product, and I agree with what George Vradenberg said, we've got to make sure that we know what the target is. And EMAP will provide us the target in terms of the local jurisdictions uh, and, and the state governments. And I think we're going to have to build a little bit of a unique EMAP model from a regional perspective, but that's not in the too hard to do list. Did anyone else want to make any comment about the assessment or standards? Then I'm going to, um, yes, Mr. White. Madam Chair, I just note that, um, you know, I guess we've talked quite a bit uh, today about the um, Sarbanes Amendment, but there is a provision in that that does require that this assessment be made on an annual basis and report back to the Congress. So I think there, that's a good mechanism. Uh, I think we can talk about what are the standards that are used for assessment. I think the fact is that we need an assessment. <laughs> We all need an assessment. You need an assessment. Uh, the region needs its own assessment. And there's got to be some place for it to be done and some mechanism and some way for it to be done. And here's, here's an opportunity uh, that that can be done. And some standards. Uh, just a, I just want a yes or no answer. Mr. Kelson, do you think the Sarbanes Amendment is good? And uh, Ms. For Mr. Forsman. Uh, I support his uh, comments reference to standards. I think the focus for the National Capital Region needs to be there. I think the Sarbanes Amendment is one way of doing that. Mm -hmm. The attributes that the Sarbanes Amendment would provide in terms of the National Capital Region focus, I think, is needed. Okay, very good. I think there seems to be uh, unanimity on that. Thank you. Ms. Norton. Uh, Madam Chair, I know you're trying to, uh, to hasten the end of the hearing. If I'm going to ask one, one more case method question, and then I'm going to ask a series of uh, questions of specific members and ask for short answers to those questions. All right, uh, Mr. White, here is the, the case method question. Um, and I ask it in part because everybody is, the Metro, if you're talking about the, remember, the, the, the uh, scenario I'm using is the average person who lives in this region. Okay, let's say the average person uses Metro. Um, and in a real sense, one might be more frightened if one were in Metro than if one were in an office building. You will recall that this committee had a couple of hearings uh, a couple of years ago when people were caught underground in Metro when nobody even thought of 9-11. And communication between Metro and those underground was, was very much flawed. We since had hearings, learned that that had, of course, been straightened out as to that particular situation. Nevertheless, let me ask you, if one, if I am in a subway, if I am in Metro, um, what should I know? Who is going to tell me? And what instructions have you given to whoever it is is going to tell me if I'm in a train underground when some event takes place uh, in, in, in the region? Well, the issue of how we communicate with our customers when they're in the system is certainly uh, something that we've uh, worked very hard at trying to enhance our capabilities on. You make reference to uh, you know, some issues that we had a, a couple of summers ago. Um, and uh, we've uh, certainly learned from some of those things. We have, um, uh, put all of our train operators through a very rigorous uh, a program of making sure uh, that if our trains are stopped for uh, any unusual amount of time, uh, that, the, that, the, that the train operator gets on the PA system inside in the rail cars and provides that information to our customers. And I'll, although I can't sit here today and tell you Will that... Will the train then, operator know Yes, what the train operator is going to get their information from our central control system. And we, you have communication, uh, state-of-the-art technology that will let them know exactly... That's not the problem. Getting the information from our control center to our train operator is not the problem. Making sure that that human intervention takes place where that train oper operator proactively 
uh, provides that information in a way that's not too nondescript or too generic to have some meaning to the customers. In addition, we have some other uh, tools that are being put in our system. We do have uh, uh, passenger information systems uh, where it tells people when the next train is going to arrive. Those signs uh, in the system uh, have the capability of uh, uh, being overridden to provide uh, emergency information. So if you're on a platform, not in a train, but on a platform waiting for a train to come in, there's two techniques. It's a sign in the station and the PA system in the station itself. So we have multiple ways of communicating to our people when they're in the system what is going on and what they should be doing. Th thank you, Mr. White. Mr. Cogdell, thank you for the work that the NCPC has done to try to get this ugly uh, set of barriers that say don't come to this region don't, and certainly don't come to this city. Thank you for your help in getting the White House to send over an amendment to begin the process of funding the plan. Let me ask you um, um, uh, about the circulator. Uh, you have proposed that a circulator be, be, uh, be able to maneuver downtown, including going across Pennsylvania Avenue. Uh, how would how would we be, how would you uh, make sure that that circulator, which goes across Pennsylvania Avenue, which you have indicated should not be opened, uh, would in fact be secure? Would it be able to pick up everybody? How would security be done? That is still in the, in the planning stages, but we have allowed for that with, if you remember from the Van Valkenburg uh, renderings that were done as part of our plan, uh, we, we, one of the criteria that we established was for access for a circulator. Um, we are currently in the midst of, of working this out with the city, with the bid, with the other business elements within the city to determine what the needs are, uh, how much capacity we're going to need, and we're also looking at the costing elements of that. Um, this is part also of this appropriation that you just mentioned. Some of that money will be allocated to study this, this particular aspect of it, to go from this very abstract theoretical idea of a circulator, not just in front of the White House, but through about four or five other areas within the monumental core. And we'll look at that and then come back with a, a clear understanding of, of what th we need to do and then rec a recommendation for how to fund it. Is the Secret Service involved in your work? Yes, ma'am. And Secret Service was involved in your work when you recommended that E Street be reopened as well, was it not? Yes, ma'am. Uh, Mr. DeRouge, um, um, I was very disappointed uh, when um, FEMA uh, apparently expressed some concern about going into a specific location in the District of Columbia, sending, uh, I think, quite insensitively a message out, you know, watch out, you 180,000 or so employees may be in a dangerous situation because even FEMA doesn't want to go to where uh, FEMA had already signed off on going. Uh, it was not, uh, uh, it, it was not a very pleasant, it was not, uh, uh, in my judgment, professional, and I made the, 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 the head of FEMA understand just how we felt about the way in which that got out to the public. My question for you, since you were, were clear, since FEMA was clear it wanted to be in the District of Columbia, wouldn't that be something? FEMA looked like it's too scared to be in the District of Columbia, but the rest of y'all better stay here. My question to you is, have you found a building yet? Have you found a site yet uh, that is safe enough for you? Are you talking about the FEMA headquarters yeah. uh, situation? A as you know, that's that's been held in abeyance for a, a couple of reasons. One, the site that was uh, being proposed uh, was determined not not to be uh, suitable from a security standpoint based on the, the current environment that we're in. And number two, until the Homeland Security issue is finally settled and how we integrate uh, into that, we uh, suspended the uh, the, the looking at the uh, mm -hmm. alternate site. Okay, Mr. Zerouge, be careful about how, how you communicate. People look to you first and foremost. Uh, other employees look to you first and foremost for courage. Uh, let me ask a couple of questions of Mr. Laporte, uh, finally, and these will be my last two questions, Madam Chair. An, OB, an o OPM spokesman, perhaps one uh, too far down in the bureaucracy, allowed as how uh, the D.C. hadn't spent uh, the money that you had been allocated by the Congress of the United States. Uh, is it, in, in fact, has the district spent the money allocated to it uh, in the O2 appropriation? I can assure you that we have spent, and we will um, 
account for every dime, have spent the $12.6 million that came to the District of Columbia Emergency Management Agency, and we are well on meeting all spending targets in the other funds that came and that had a two-year life cycle. We're well beyond halfway points of expending those funds. In fact, are finding plenty of areas where additional needs are, are becoming quite clear, especially of the $12.6 million that ended this coming September 30th. And would, it will be challenging going forward of the community preparedness, business, industry, schools, universities, to keep continuing to meet the need that the citizens are just clamoring for. Well, I mean, since, since OPM put this on the record, it does seem to me that on the record we ought to clear up that OPM, uh, uh, OMB, I'm sorry, OPM, do forgive me, o <laughs> OMB and, and, and the Congress uh, allocated this money in tranches to the district, and you have, in fact, met that. Finally, I've just got to ask you, uh, and, and, uh, uh, Mr. Laporte, and I suppose I, there's a soft spot here for the fire department for me since Lieutenant Richard Holmes entered the D.C. Fire Department in 1902. But I tell you, when I read in the newspaper that uh, pending uh, the uh, renovation of the firehouse at Tenley Circle, that there the firemen have been put in a place where there's no water, no showers, no cooking, no trash pickup. Uh, I really have to wonder, uh, not about uh, whether, you, whether the district is prepared for terrorism or whether they're prepared to treat people who we depend upon uh, in terrorist attack and on a daily basis, uh, whether we are, we, we are in fact treating those employees as we should. Have you got anything to report? Uh, on that matter, which was in, in, in the Post just this week? I, too, read that piece and was a bit dismayed. And I know um, uh, Deputy Mayor Kellams has been uh, addressing that issue. And it, it, at least 20 percent of the funds that came into D.C. EMA were turned around and forwarded to the fire department, especially the hazardous material needs uh, we found after 9-11, the amount of runs we we went through through Amthrax, the amount of training we've given to the fire department. But I think it continues to, to show that it's an area of great need and challenge, but there's there's no braver men and women than the fire and EMS folks in the District of Mr. Columbia. Mr. LaPorte, you're not, of course, in charge of the fire department. Would you, uh, w within one week, will you let this committee know whether, whether the conditions I've just outlined for those firefighters has been uh, improved. Uh, would you carry back to the D.C. to the district, who, whoever is in charge, so that we will know what has been done to erase that situation? One question for Mr. Hatch. Mr. Hatch, I was very uh, pleased at the kind of simultaneous communication that is going on uh, between uh, OPM, GSA, and FEMA on w just what to do with employees. Then, but there's a lot of confusion here because apparently on their own, um, agencies can close down uh, their agencies. And I, I still don't know who is in charge. I think it's very good that all three of you com are communicating before and anybody moves. But okay, after you all communicated, who is in charge of saying whether or not the government will close down? And uh, where does that leave the agency head who apparently has authority on her own to close down or stay open? You're absolutely correct that each agency, the director of each agency, is autonomous within their own building and with their own employees. Of course, the government wouldn't close down because there was a fire at Commerce. But director of OPM, uh, in this instance now, Kay Coles James, is the individual that will make the call as to the overall operating status of the federal government. And that will be the recommendation. And does that mean an individual agency could not keep open and could not close? I mean, they have to do what she says? It is very much like a field commander. Uh, if, if there is a director that feels that, that if there were, for instance, as you brought up earlier, if there were a radiological device right outside or if they had information that the worst thing that could happen would be their employees running out the door, then yes, they, of course, would take the responsibility to do what is necessary to protect their, their citizens and employees. But only in case of emergency can and she act independently. She, uh, she the agency head. The, the only in the case of a specific emergency, yeah. and the recommendation will come from OPM. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much, and thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Norton. Um, 
we do have, uh, we still have some questions. We want to thank you very much for your uh, seven ranking. We want to bring it up to, uh, to 10 as soon as we can. Uh, and what I thought was particularly um, important is bringing you all to the table together. And I know you do communicate with each other, but I hope this will enhance that communication. And um, I hope that we will be meeting with you again soon to get the assessment, the, um, the standards, the uh, plan for the business community, for the citizenry, for the technology that may be needed. And, um, and I hope you will feel free to get any information to us that we may not have mentioned and may not get to you in questions. And so um, I'm going to consider then this subcommittee uh, of the District of Columbia now adjourned and thank each and every one of you. You have been great to be here. And thank you for the progress that's been made in our emergency preparedness. A reminder that our campaign 2002 coverage continues tonight at 8 Eastern with a Pennsylvania governor's debate. Former Philadelphia Mayor Ed Rendell, a Democrat, will face Republican State Attorney General Mike Fisher 